Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Google TV, or how I learned to stop worrying in exploit secure boot. My name is uh, Mike Baker. I'm a uh, firmware developer. I did uh, OpenWRT. We also have. We also have Hans Nielsen, who's a uh, senior security consultant at Madasano. We have CJ Hughes, an IT systems administrator. Ganophage, uh, I believe he's out running CTF right now. And we have Tom Dwanger in the audience. And yeah, stand up, Tom. And we have Amir Edmada, who's a uh, researcher at uh, Acuvent Labs and also the founder of the GTV Hacker Group. So GTV Hacker is a uh, group of about six hackers that hack into the Google TV line of products. Our primary goal is to bypass the hardware and software restrictions and open up the device. The uh, GTV Hacker team was the first to exploit the Google TV and won a uh, $500 bounty. So what is the Google TV platform? The Google TV platform is an Android device that uh, connects to your TV. So your TV essentially becomes the same Android device as your mobile phone. It uh, has HDMI in, HDMI out, and IR. Um, some of them include Blu-ray players. The Sony TV has an integrated Google TV. It has a custom version of Chrome and a uh, flash version that I'll uh, talk about later. So why do we hack the platform? We hack the platform because unlike the Google Nexus devices, it has a locked bootloader, it has a heavily restricted kernel, and the uh, previous generation, the generation one, is now end of life. And the flash player, I'll get to that in the uh, next slides. So before we start, I'm going to do a very quick recap of the stuff we did last year at DEF CON. I'm going to speed through it, so if you miss something, go look at last year's slides. So the generation one hardware consists of the Logitech Review, the Sony Blu-ray player, and the Sony TV. The Logitech Review, they left a root UART. Uh, we also have an exploit by Dan Rossingberg that uh, uses DevMem. And Sorok wrote a uh, impactor plug-in. Awesome. So the uh, Sony, uh, similar situation. It has a no dev bug. Uh, we also wrote a custom recovery for it and uh, used kexec to load in a new kernel. So now we have unsigned kernels. So let's talk about the Flash player. The Flash player was blocked by various streaming sites. So for example, you can't watch Hulu. You get redirected to a site that says, sorry, this is a Google TV. And the fix for that is literally just changing the version string. So what happened after we hacked these Google TV devices? We found this. This is a nice message from Logitech that they hid in the Android recovery. It's a ROT13 cipher that says, GTV hacker, congratulations if you're reading this. Please post a note on the form and let us know, or let me know. And includes all of our nicknames. Yes, wh whoever is at Logitech that wrote that, you are awesome. This is why we hack devices. <laughs> so the Boxy Box is a very similar device. It uses the same SOC. In the process of hacking the Google TV, we also came up with an exploit for the Boxy. That led the way to the Boxy Plus community, um, and it's still vulnerable. So that's awesome. So next up is Amir. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to continue uh, the presentation. Uh, my section regards Gen 2 hardware and uh, one of the first O-days we're going to release for uh, uh, the platform, uh, Gen 2 at least. So Gen 2 hardware, we have um, a multitude of devices. They increased the amount of devices they had. 
um, by like a factor of two. Um, and I guess they were going to increase the market share, but essentially you have the Korean LG U plus the ASUS Cube, the LG 47 G2 and G3, the Netgear Prime, the Sony NS GS7, GS8, the Hisense Pulse, and the Vizio CoStar. Um, they have a similar uh, hardware design throughout most of the generation, short of the LG 47 G2 and G3. Um, generation 2 features a Marvell 88DE 3100 based chipset. Um, it's an ARM dual 1.2 gigahertz processor dubbed the Armada 1500. It features an on die crypto processor with separate memory and it uh, does secure boot from ROM via RSA uh, verification and AES decryption. Um, this particular slide, um, there's not a whole lot that you really need to pull from this. It was just directly from their uh, marketing stuff for the chip. Um, yeah, it's just here to show you kind of how they pried the uh, chipset itself. Um, skip the placeholder apparently. So platform information. Uh, the newest version of GTV is currently on Android 3.2. Uh, there was no public vulnerabilities that worked up until a week ago, uh, maybe a week plus when the master key vulnerability um, and you know the key signing bugs were uh, big news um, and Impactor wrote his amazing tool or uh, Sark wrote his amazing tool Impactor. Um, it is not a bionic libc uh, setup. It's a fat glibc setup um, and it doesn't support Android native libraries currently. Um, so Gen 1 was an Intel CE4150 which is an x86 single core Atom 1.2 gigahertz. Gen 2 is a Marvel Armada 1500 dual core um, uh, ARM 1.2 gigahertz so they switched from x86 to ARM. Android 4.2 incoming for Gen 2 adds native libraries and bionic libc from what we've heard in the rumor mills. So I'm going to go through these next devices pretty quickly because, you know, it's all public information. I'm sure you guys don't really care too much. Um, 8 gigabyte eMMC flash inside of the Sony NSC GS7. It has the best remote so if you're going to buy a Google TV I, we probably recommend this one. Hard to recommend Sony. Um, larger form factor than the, some of the other Google TV devices. Uh, and it has built in IR blasters which sounds like something that would be throughout the entire platform but it's sadly not. The Vizio CoStar features a smaller form factor, no voice search, a custom launcher, a $99 MSRP and updates are actually done through update logic as opposed to the standard Android check-in system. Uh, it's common in all Vizio devices. So the Hisense Pulse was this has the second best remote in our opinion. It was launched with ADB running as root when it first was released so if you pick one up uh, before it's actually updated you could just ADB in, ADB root uh, and you know ADB is uh, has root privileges. So it was patched shortly after um, and it has a $99 MSRP. With ADB root there was also a UART root set up uh, I guess for debugging and whatnot. Um, and they had RO debuggable set as one. So ADB root was all you really needed if you wanted a software root but if you wanted to have some fun, you know, connect your UART adapters that we give you after this. You could technically connect to uh, that pin out that's right up there. Uh, again we'll have a select number of uh, USB TTL adapters. So the Netgear Neo TV Prime has a horrible remote. Uh, it's $129 MSRP. We had two exploits for it. One was real. Uh, one was technically an oversight at least in our opinion. Um, the oversight was that they went ahead and put uh, the console to start up uh, on UART regardless of what RO.secure was set as. RO.secure is set to for like if they're in a debug environment they'll set RO.secure to zero um, and if they're not in a debug environment they'll set it RO.secure to one um, for just setting up special lockdowns. Uh, then we did the Neo TV prime route which was essentially a exploit that leveraged uh, the update system on the Neo, uh, the Netgear Neo TV prime. Essentially the process involves uh, checking if persist.radio.test mode is enabled and if it is it extracts a test mode.tgz from a USB drive to dot slash temp and then it just straight executes a shell script from that uh, file. So you run it, uh, you get uh, local command execution fairly easily with just a thumb drive with a special uh, TGVC file and uh, shell script. So then the ASUS Cube, um, it's the same generation 2 hardware, horrible remote again, uh, $139 MSRP but we really like this box because of this next part, cube root. So we had a lot of fun with this. We hadn't actually done a Android, uh, an Android APK that actually leveraged one of our exploits up until this point. So it was really neat to be able to put this together. 
um, and kind of uh, certain members were a big portion of this. Um, so this was great because we created an app that not only exploits but it patches your ASUS cube because our whole fear was that releasing an exploit into the market, you know, if someone else takes a look at it, they could, you know, put it in their own app and, you know, root all your Google TVs. Um, so we set it up so that uh, it can do patching and it can do rooting. But essentially how it worked is it exploited a helper app called Oplay Helper via a world writable Unix domain socket. The helper application passed unsanitized input to the mount command um, resulting in local command execution. Uh, we triggered the vulnerability from Android APK that just literally showed network permissions and it was point click pwn. We added it to the Google Play Store just for fun. Um, so with that being said, uh, it was pulled by Google after six days. Um, we rooted around 256 boxes including one engineer build which was pretty cool. Um, and it took two months for them to actually patch it. So, you know, it, with six days in the market, can you imagine the type of uh, damage someone could have actually done if they were trying to be malicious and not just help people unlock their devices? So then we got to the O day that I told you guys about. Um, we haven't, we've been using this bug for a while to do our investigations on like new devices and research on new devices to kind of just see how things are set up. So this is kind of something that's near and dear to us because it's worked on the entire platform uh, to date. So what it is is we call it the magic USB. We just like saying magic because we're on the pen and teller stage I guess. Um, so if you recall our plastic exploits with the Sony uh, Gen 1 GTV, it required four USBs. Um, you could narrow down the number to a lot lower but you had to have a bunch of different uh, images for the USB drive. Uh, and it, it uh, leveraged an improperly mounted uh, EXT3 uh, drive that was mounted without no dev. So this is pretty similar to that. It's NTFS but it's not uh, but and it's not done in recovery uh, but it's just as, just as powerful. So all Google TVs and some other Android devices are vulnerable. What this bug is is, is um, actually I'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, the way that this is set up it requires uh, a user to have an NTFS removable storage device it requires the devices to be mounted no dev when you plug it in so you can easily just run mount and see if it's no dev. Um, and so it affects more than just Android. It's, it affects certain kernel uh, configurations. So or certain Linux configurations. So with this particular setup, Vold mounts NTFS uh, partitions without no dev and uh, it's a little known feature. It, it does support uh, block devices. So our magic USB essentially the process is that you uh, you go, you um, get the major and minor hashes, uh, you set up a device on a separate computer um, on an NTFS formatted drive, you plug it into your Google TV and you DD directly to that newly created device that's on your USB drive. The kernel does its magic um, even though the partitions are mounted read only, it overwrites them just beautifully. So we dump the boot image, we patch in it.rc, uh, or default.prop to ro.secure. We write it back as a user, no root needed. Um, we reboot and we're rooted. Uh, Sony boxes require an additional step. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce Hans Nielsen. Oh, yeah. Hello, I'm Hans. So one thing that we really love doing here at GTV Hacker is we like taking things apart and then we like soldering little wires to things. Um, it, it, it tickles something deep in our brain that makes us feel very, very good. Um, so there's a few platforms out there, you know, some, some interesting Google TV platforms. One of them is this TV that's made by LG. Um, it's an interesting implementation of the platform. They use a different chip than the rest of the Gen 2 Google TVs. It has a custom chip called the ARM L9. It's a uh, custom LG SOC that they use in it. Um, LG also signed pretty much everything in terms of images on the flash file system including the boot splash images. So this platform has always kind of eluded us. Um, you know, it's, it's in a full 47 inch LCD TV and it's very upmarket because it's a Google TV, you know, it's cool. So this thing's over a thousand dollars and you know, we really didn't want to spend a thousand dollars on it. So what are we going to do? Well, 
I mean, we like taking things apart. We like putting things back together. So we did the next best thing, which was on eBay, we just bought a power supply and a motherboard from the TV. We didn't actually buy the rest of the TV. And it turns out you can get that for not that much. So as soon as we had this, we did that thing that we love so much. We soldered some wires to it. So this hardware is based around that LG SOC. And the storage it uses on this is it uses an EMMC flash chip. So it's very similar to an SD card. It just has a few extra little bits that allow for secure boot storage and other stuff like that. Um, but essentially what it allows us to do is that we can just solder you know, very few number of wires to this thing and hook it up directly to an SD card reader. And with that SD card reader, we can read and write from the flash on the device at will. You know, no issues here. So like most devices will have a NAND chip. It's much trickier to write those. They have a lot more pins. The interface is, is you know, there just aren't as many common available pieces of hardware to read that for you. But SD, everyone has an SD reader. So to actually root this thing, we spent a while just digging through the file system, seeing what is, the, what is here, you know, how can we pull stuff apart. Um, at OX 100,000 hex, we found the partition information that tells us where each of the different partitions that are used in this device are. Um, so what we did now was we just went through each of the partitions looking for, OK, is this one signed? Can we do anything with it? Is there fun stuff here? So one of the more interesting partitions, as usual, is system, because that contains the majority of the files used to actually run Google TV. That's where all the APKs live. That's where all the libc lives. Um, so like we said, all of the file system stuff was signed pretty much. But it turns out that they did not sign the system image. So once we figured that out, it was just a matter of unpacking the system image, figuring out what in that system image gets quickly called by the bootloader, and then messing with it. So it turns out that the boot partition, um, you can see on the right side here, there is part of the boot scripts. Um, at the bottom, it calls this vendor bin init for strip.sh. So that's on, that's on system. So we just replaced that file to spawn a shell, um, connected a UART. I, you know, again, we love soldering wires to things. And uh, there we go. Then we have root. All on a device that we never actually bought the full thing of. So another device that we did this to was the Sony NSZ GS7 and GS8. They also went with this EMMC flash interface. So on this platform, neither boot nor system were signed. So just a matter of rewriting those partitions. So the first thing that we did is the usual way to do this in Android is you modify the boot properties to say, OK, ro.secure is 0 so that you can just straight up ADB to the, the device, and everything will just be great, easy, simple. Um, but we did that, and it didn't work. So it turns out that the init scripts were actually checking signatures for some stuff, and it was also making sure that some of these properties weren't set. So it's like, OK, ro.secure must be one. Well, so we went around looking at how, how is the signature stuff working, and it turns out that they're just not verifying those signatures. So it was pretty simple to just replace init. And then we were able to do whatever we wanted. And yeah, this, this, this is why you don't allow hardware access to systems, because you get to do things like this, and then we win. Um, another fun feature that this device had is it had a SATA port, unpopulated SATA header inside the device. But it did actually have the necessary uh, um, passive components on the hardware to support this. So we soldered a SATA connector to it and plugged in a hard drive. Um, so far, it doesn't appear that the kernel actually supports these things, but the hard drive is actually spinning up, and we're pretty sure it is working, and we'll talk more about that. Um, so beyond those two devices, there's another device that came out very recently. Um, very interesting device, very similar. It's, it's, it's an interesting evolution of the GTV family. Uh, Google Chromecast. Um, Google announced this device last week, uh, last Wednesday even. It's $35. You know, this is 
order of magnitude cheaper than pretty much any GTD, any current GTV device. Um, it doesn't have the same in and out for HDMI that all the other GTV devices do. It just straight up, you plug it into the TV, and then you power it from a USB cable, and boom, you have something that you can use to share videos. Um, it's actually a really awesome device, and we think it's very cool. Um, in many ways, we think it solves some of the issues that GTV has had in the past with, you know, it's a kind of expensive niche platform. Um, it's really interesting device. Instead of having two thick clients to deal with stuff, deal with content, you now have one thinner device that goes with your thick device, say your phone or your, your computer, and then you can share content directly to it. Um, so one of the interesting things about that is, so this is a thin device. How, how are you pushing content to this device? Well, you're not just streaming video from your phone. You know, that's, that, that's really slow. That's hard to do. So this device is actually reasonably powerful. So what's in it? Well, we pulled it apart as soon as we could. And it turns out that it has pretty, pretty standard stuff that you kind of see for an embedded device. It has RAM, it has flash, it has a Wi-Fi chip, and it has a CPU. The CPU is a Marvell 88D3005. Now, this instantly made us go, oh, well, this is cool, because the Marvell 88D3100 is what we've been seeing in most of the Gen 2 Google TVs. So it was very interesting to see this Marvell device in here. And when, when we saw that, you know, we, we start getting suspicious. You know, why is this device in here? Um, maybe this shares similarities to the Google TV platform. Um, so the first thing that we did is say, OK, well, this thing's going to have a UART in it. So let's go find that. So we found the UART and started looking at the uh, kernel output from this device. Turns out that it is very, very, very similar to a Google TV. It even says booting GTV kernel when you look at the uh, UART output. And other things that it has, it has a USB port on it that you use to power it. But when you if, you if you plug that into your computer example with a standard USB data cable, you don't actually get anything there. The device doesn't show up or anything. And, that's because it's not actually a USB device. It runs in USB host mode. So you can actually, using a USB on the go cable, plug other devices into the Chromecast directly. Um, another very, very fun feature was that it has the same bootloader as the DE3100. It shares the, uh, if you look at the source code drop that Google provided for this device, it's the same bootloader. In fact, there's almost no references to the 3005 in there. The references are pretty much all for the 3100. So it's very, very similar to previous Google TV platforms. So of course, the first thing we do is say, OK, well, now we have this thing. How can we get root on it? Um, well, part of that involved how do we actually get to a point where we can you know, run a recovery on this device. It's really restricted. You know, all we have is this UART. We've got this host mode USB port, and we've got HDMI. And we also have one button. I like buttons. So with this button, because the first thing that you do with the button is you press it while it's rebooting, see what happens. Um, and it turns out that holding this button down causes fun things in the bootloader. The bootloader actually has a very special recovery mode where instead of doing a normal you know, Android-style recovery where it boots a Linux kernel and then, you know, you have whole recovery system there and it does signature verification, all that fun stuff. Instead, what it does is it's a much lower level recovery. It runs some code in the bootloader that reads directly from a USB stick. So that host mode USB port turns out to be useful for this recovery mode. So the bootloader is really simple. They tried to put not too much stuff in there. So it's not even like there's a file system available for this bootloader. Instead, it just reads directly from the from OX1000 on that USB key. It leaves just enough space to put a fat file system, not a fat file system, a, uh, an MBR header, and then data. So now that we discovered, OK, well, we can actually try and get it to load images from here. How do, we, how do we figure out what image format it's loading? And it's, 
It's the uh, it, it's actually the same standard Marvell image format that we'd seen on a lot of other Google TV devices. Um, so we found an image. Okay. Well, can, can we boot stuff? Do we have you know signed kernels, other signed images we can try running on here? See if we can get anything to run. Well, we spent some time looking at the code. And what we found was um, a very significant oversight. It turns out that if you don't verify the result of your signature check, your secure boot doesn't work very well. <laughs> so the original route for this thing was actually pretty straightforward once you figured out the map, the all of the weird steps to get there, like you had to hold down the button, and you had to have USB on the go, and you had to have a flash drive with stuff at the right spot. And eventually, you get to the point you say, oh, well, okay, I can load an image on here now. Wait, why is, why is my Im image verification not failing? Well, it's because they don't fail it when you verify the image. So we managed to actually get root on there. It's awesome. Um, Google has already patched this. They released an update for this yesterday. So I don't know how readable the source code is, but essentially that green blob on the right side is the patch from Google that says if ret return one or negative one. So they patched that. We're a little sad, but we are looking into, excuse me. So we have a little tradition at DEF CON. First time speakers get to do a shot on stage. These guys are all first time. They have to. Have <laughs> to. Let's give them all a big round of applause for their first time. Audience. <laughs> <laughs> cheers. Yeah, 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 cheers. cheers. There we go. All right. No, but you know My what? Wife will do it. That's, that's, that's a wife right there. Yes. Notice I didn't say the wife, that is a wife. Very important. All right. Cheers. Cheers. First-time speakers, come on! Now we'll see if they can keep going with the presentation and pick up where they left off. I'm not that much of a lightweight. There you go. Thank you. Indeed, thank you. So that's actually pretty much it for the Chromecast stuff. So. <laughs> 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 very, very convenient. Um, and now I don't have to worry about speaking with a shot in me. So, CJ. Yes, welcome in. So now, my introduction, lovely picture. I, we have root through the NTFS trick. It works great, we can write whatever we want. But Relating back to the SATA header, we want more. We want to run our own kernels. We don't like locked bootloaders. So, secure boot exploit. Let's actually make it work. And this time, they did, I promise you, they checked the return code. So, it's a bit more real of an exploit. So, to start off, there was the Armada 1000, which was the 88DE3010, the older version of the Armada 1500, or the 88DE3100. Now, very similar chips, just the 88DE3100 was a bit faster. So we believe that this exploit should also work on pretty much every Android-based Armada 1000 because the bootloader was provided by Marvel to whoever wanted it and the flaw is in that. So list of devices we, it should work on. Left-hand side, the Sony NSC GS7, the Netgear Neo TV Prime, Vizio Costa, Hisense Pulse, Asus Cube, the Sony NSC GS8, the LG U Plus IPTV, Google's Berlin development device, which is very similar to the Vizio Costa. Um, also devices we believe it should work on but haven't tested because we don't have them. The Zero Desktop Mi PC, which is coming out in about two or three weeks, though they could patch it by then. Uh, the Hisense XT780 TV, which should be out any moment. 
might also patch it, but sometimes they don't because it's already being produ produced. The Lenovo S31 slash S61 TV, which is available in China, the TCL MoFo that should be out soon, and others, there may be other vendors using this chip that we're unaware of. So for a detailed security overview of how the, the entire system boots, starting from the internal secure crypto subprocessor, the box will power on, it will then execute the ROM code that's built into it, and it will load stage two. Stage two exists either on NAND, EMMC, or over SPI. But when it loads it in, it will first AES decrypt it with a key that's stored inside the CPU, and then it will RSA verify it with its own public-private key pair. You know, RSA file signed private, pub, everybody knows how that works. Um, so if it decrypts and verifies successfully, it will then return, it will actually have a return code, and it will return a one or a zero depending on how it boots, and it will either fail or continue. Sorry, I'll slow down. <laughs> All right. I'll take a sip. <laughs> Hold on. Another shot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So next up, stage two will then execute. So assuming it verifies, it starts up. And then stage two will finish the initialization on EMMC um, that we could, could remind you, modify to pretty much do whatever we want. And it will then load stage three to 0x0680000. We'll admit these addresses are somewhat important, but we'll just consider it bootloader address, kernel address, RAM disk address. So that will load in. And assuming it then decrypts and verifies properly, it will then execute stage three. Stage three is the bootloader. It's a highly modified version of U-boot. It's mostly stripped out. It's kind of funny, but it's simple. Um, it also has, you know, support to boot secure images. It will send the image directly to the secure boot processor, send it back to make sure it's good. So upon execution, it will then load the kernel to 0x01000800. Assuming then, again, it decrypts it verifies and it's all good and it returns a value that it checks. It will then continue to load the RAM disk to 0x, I think that's about 2 million or so. It will call it the RAM disk address. Once that's done, it will then execute the kernel. The kernel and the command lines that are set inside the bootloader will then set um, a hash to check the init script to ensure that the init script, I'm sorry, the init binary hasn't, hasn't been tampered with due to the RSA SIG checking that was somehow broken. Um, then it will then verify the RSA signatures on the init scripts, which we know don't work, but I'm sure they probably will work within about a week. But back to the UART, which keep in mind we are giving away UART adapters right after this. They're kind of pointy, but they're free. So pulling it up, all the boxes have a UART, and we can see they have the start kernel at 01008000. Um, so, again, keep that address in mind. It is important. A lot of data to throw at you, but it will work. So this is a picture of the Android kernel and Marvel Secure Image. Normal Android header with the Android magic, then has some kernel arguments which it doesn't use, then some encrypted gunk below it. So keep that Android header, kernel header in mind. Now if you take a look at AOSP's bootimage.h, you have a struct for the kernel header itself. Um, character magic, Android with the exclamation point. Then you have the kernel size, kernel address, RAM disk size, RAM disk address, second size, second address, SHA1 hash, some of the stuff that not really relevant right now. I'm going to pull up a mocked version of this image and give you a minute to review while I take a sip of this. So the mocked up version of the Android kernel and Marvel secure image. Um, top left you have your Android magic. Keep in mind these slides will be posted up maybe in about an hour on dc21.gtvhacker.com with all of the files. We'll get the stuff up on the wiki rather shortly thereafter. Um, can't really trust the network here, so we might wait until Monday when we're back home. But getting back to this, Android magic, then kernel size, then we have the kernel load address. After the kernel load address, we have the RAM disk size, the RAM disk load address. Then we have the kernel load arguments, which surprisingly are replaced on boot when we initially started trying to get into this box, we attempted, we dumped the image, noticed the Android kernel header, we figured we could mess around with the command lines. It might work. 
tried that, but we wanted to fail safe, so we went with the EMMC flash backup. That wasn't, we were able to replace the kernel arguments, but it still wasn't changing. So we figured they were replaced somehow, which they were. Then there's an SHA1 hash, which surprisingly we can alter and it will still boot. It does not check that. Followed by that is the actual Marvel secure image, which includes a key index, a signature, an encrypted data size, then an RSA 1024 bit signature, followed by AES 128 CBC encrypted data. So they're not messing around. But let's take a second look at that header the RAM disk size and the RAM disk load address. In the red is the RAM disk size, the black is the RAM disk load address. What we can do, for some idiotic reason, they do not verify the RAM disk load address. So we can change it to whatever we want and it will execute our code, especially if we place it right where the kernel should be loading. This loads in right after the kernel and since we change the RAM disk load address, we can then replace the RAM disk with our own unsigned kernel with SATA support or whatever we want, jam it in there, when we boot the box, it will automatically boot up to that. So some pseudocode of what the bootloader code will, looks like. We have a fixed kernel load address. It does an EMMC read about line four. Uh, some printfs. Then it does a, we thought this was load image. It turns out it's verify image. A verify image um, on the kernel image itself. And it actually has an if to check the return code. It does, you know, if else. And but if you notice, after the return, it will then load the RAM disk. It will check the RAM disk header size to see what it is and if it's actually set to something. It will then load in, in an arbitrary amount of data at whatever address we give it, which horribly insecure because, because of that, we were able to own the box. Now, for the Sony NSC GS7, it was a bit different. Sony went above and beyond with its security. They also signed the RAM disk image, so we couldn't just replace it. However, what we, what we could do is append a small, add a small kernel and append it with our RAM disk, which was a custom kernel, and stick that into the RAM disk location and then just offset the RAM disk load address. So instead of, you know, 01000008000, we could set it to say 01000098000 or something. And then it, we could still get a hacked kernel to load in at just the right address and still execute. Sony's made quite a few blunders like this trying to improve security. I don't know what's up. So placeholder image, and now U-boot. We can, through this exploit, which we are releasing these packages for most Google TVs right now, you can also trigger and run U-boot, which will let you load an unsigned kernel image directly from USB, TFTP, or you could modify the source code to wherever you want. The ASUS Cubes GPL release had a version of U-boot that we were able to modify and then get it to execute with no issues, and we could load a kernel via TFTP, as I said, flash, or USB for development. So I'm going to skip this future research this time and show you guys a quick demo. And I pass that up. Thank you. I don't use Max. Where's my mouse? <laughs> Thank you. So we're also going to show the a quick. Come on. I look totally computer. <laughs> Seriously. Fix me. <laughs> Nice. Let's get the image. There we go. We're gonna hide this. So what we're doing right now? Um, There's nothing on the screen. Really? Yeah. Do this. Hey, this is your computer, not mine. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I just I, this blame isn't totally on me. Blaming you too. Oh, that's awesome. No, there you go. Move it to oh. your right, move it to your right. Yay! Let's get a round of sound for everyone in the audience. Sweet. So, um, you're probably not going to be able to make this out. It's going to be on YouTube probably when we're off the stage. Uh, just uh, check out our GTV Hacker channel. Uh, what we're doing right now, we're pulling up um, Asus Cube. We're going to do the NTFS exploit. We wrote two block devices, I'm sorry, character devices, block or character, onto an NTFS flash drive. Then we, in, we stuck it inside the ASUS cube, and what we're going to do right now is run flash erase on the normal one that doesn't work since we don't have root permissions, and then run flash erase and NAN write on our modified version to then insert a custom recovery that we created. Keep in mind our custom recovery is rather thin. Um, they, it's not like we can just you know, port CWM to it and call it a day because CWM's frame buffer uses Android's frame buffer, which the Google TV boxes do not have. 
the Google TV boxes have a very specific custom version which is idiotic. So right now it's showing um, it being written and erased and we'll give that a moment and watch blurry text while we listen to an old Model M keyboard rattle away. So that was the erase and now we're going to do the NAND write and I have a typo so it's going to error at first. Yeah, th this took many, many takes because I do not know how to use a camera. So it shows the permission denied trying to write the actual MTD device and then we're going to show my typo. And honestly, I do not know what I mistyped, but something happened. So there's the error. Now we're going to do the actual write of the custom recovery we created. This is the slow part of the video, watching everything type, and then it picks up. Copy, paste, enter, write, 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 showing that we can write to anything on the box we want using that NTFS trick, which should work on many, many devices because most people don't know you, an NTFS device can use block and character devices. So now we're rebooting into our custom recovery that you'll see pop up on the right hand side of the screen. Keep in mind that recovery images, kernel images, uh, signed and encrypted. I'm going to show you on the left hand side that we have um, put my handle for the kernel compiler, just showing we're putting in a USB drive with a copy of U boot on it that we're going to then flash to replace the bootloader. So there's our custom recovery on the right um, using unsigned code. And now scrolling all the way to the top, we did a busy box ID to show we have root over UART. There's also root over ADB and if you want you can modify it to whatever, you, whatever else you want. So command line CJ000 GTB hacker just proving that it is our own custom compiled kernel running on the box. Now pressing 1, installing the custom U boot. And it's then completed. We are then going to reset, reboot the box and you'll see on the left hand side we'll get a U boot prompt letting us boot anything we want stopping auto boot and we can start whatever we need. So that's pretty much it for the demo video. I'm going to shoot it back to MBM to close up. Good luck. Well done. Well done. So links to everything that we've uh, covered in this presentation is at uh, dc21.gtvhacker.com. Uh, we thank you all for attending and we're going to hand out some UART adapters. We're looking for questions that uh, people who ask questions will get priority on UART adapters and then after that we'll just hand out whatever's left. So uh, if we can get some quick questions, anyone? Right here? What experience do you have getting apps that are not designed for TV to run on like regular Android apps? He said, what experience do we have getting Android uh, applications that are not built for the Google TV with native code to run on the Google TV? I actually did put together a native development kit um, for Google TV, but it's not in a good state that I'd feel comfortable releasing. I built a ConnectBock um, APK with just some, like it does very minimal, um, like it uses very minimal native code, but it works. I tested the native code, it works fine. Um, if anyone in the community wants to step forward and, uh, you know, help out with that, we'd appreciate it. If you want to come and grab your dongle. Anyone else? Anyone else? Right here? It's very plain. Can you say that again? Uh, he asked if we've tried JTAG debugging or if UART is sufficient. Um, UART has been sufficient up until this point. I mean, we've looked at some of the JTAG pinouts, but we haven't made a whole lot of progress with them. Uh, in the Gen 1, we did. Huh? We haven't needed JTAG. Yeah, we really honestly haven't needed it at this point. If we got down to it, we, we'd go that route, but uh, we just we haven't yet. Um, if you want to give him one, anyone? Uh, next question, right here. <laughs> he asked, besides Hulu, what other content providers have we had issues with? Uh, CBS, um, Fox, uh,
just miscellaneous uh, flash streaming sites. It's, it's actually kind of ridiculous the number of people who actually choose to block us um, or block Google TV in general. Um, if you want to He asked how many have we had success bypassing their mitigations? Uh, all of them. Uh, essentially, we just mimic the desktop flash setup. So, if you want to give him one, I think we're, I think we're, I think we're running low on time. So, uh, let me get like one or two more questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like a uh, guy in the red shirt, and then we'll we'll get the guy in the black shirt that's behind him. Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Um, it hasn't been something, uh, he asked if we've tried to get uh, Python or Perl or any other coding uh, scripting languages on the box. Um, we haven't actually worked on that, um, but it would, it would absolutely be possible. Um, yeah, Linux. so it's, it's Linux uh, at its core. So uh, let me get this, I'm sorry. I'm uh, and uh, oh wow, good throw. Uh, black shirt polo? Uh, he asked what's next for the Chromecast. We are looking at other avenues of exploitation, um, but we are afraid to mention exactly what they are based on how quickly it was patched and also that we're here so if we say anything publicly, you know, it, it could bite us uh, in the butt. So uh, if you want to someone give that gentleman one or throw one at him, sorry. Uh, yeah, please, oh my god, okay. Uh, you know, let's, let's use the honor system and pass that to him if that's cool or, you know, just leave it for Penn and Teller. Um, I think the gentleman in the black shirt next to him had a question if, unless it was already answered. No, we'd actually really love to know. So if they're here or anyone from Google is here and they'd like to talk to us, we'd really appreciate it. We haven't really had an open communication with uh, Google about much of anything. I don't know if they hate us or not. Um, <laughs> and we, we kind of get the opinion they do because they tend to shy away from ever speaking to us. Um, so. Publicly, yeah, exactly. Um, but we let's give him a UART and we'll, we'll continue this uh, in the Q and A room. Oh my God, dude! Holy. Okay, this is this is getting bad. Um, so we'll we'll follow up in the Q and A room where we can hand these things out directly yeah. instead of hurting anyone. Um, so yes, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have time for any more questions, but we will have time in the other room if uh, uh, we will have time in the other room if if any of you guys want to follow up. Thank you. Thank you. You did great. Thank you. I hope we didn't even hurt you.